it amazing how things that just stay with you for years? Open your Bibles to Psalm 11, Psalm 11, and uh, let's walk through this this morning. Uh, the Age of Enlightenment was an intellectual and philosophical movement swept across Europe and beyond in the 17th and 18th centuries. It emphasized the pursuit of happiness, sovereignty of reason, and the evidence of the senses as the primary sources of knowledge. The Great Awakenings were other major influences that emerged in the colonial times. The stirrings of the First Great Awakening impacted the colonies from 1730 into the 1760s. These were under the leadership of Jonathan Edwards, one of the most brilliant theologians ever. George Whitfield was another who arrived in America in 1738 and traveled through the colonies preaching the gospel for 34 years. And by the way, Jonathan Edwards was a staunch Puritan Calvinist, and George Whitfield was not. He preached whosoever will. And it was asked of Jonathan Edwards one day, when you get to heaven, do you think you'll see George Whitfield? And Jonathan Edwards said, I'm not sure, thinking he was questioning the evangelist's salvation, the questioner said, why? And Jonathan Edwards said, he'll be so close to the throne of God, I'm not sure I'll be able to see him. Godly men can disagree and still walk in harmony, and they did in the early colonies. There was also a third influence, and that was the election day preaching. And I've just found this out. In fact, just several months ago, uh, in conversation with Jimmy Draper, he had been asked to write a book, and uh, he said, I have discovered something I didn't know. And uh, actually not a book, but a chapter in a, uh, an academic book that's a tribute to someone called a festriff. And so in writing that chapter, he discovered the election day sermons of early colonial preachers. And what would happen is when a governor of a colony was elected or leaders was elected, they would always have a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Evangelical, Congregational, um, maybe a couple of other denominations that would come, and one of those pastors would preach. And these guys were bold in their preaching. They weren't placating the governor or anything like that, but that was an influence in, in the early founding uh, of our nation. And when new leaders were elected, they would go preach. And in 1691, James Dana preached against slave trade, against African slave trade. The seeds of abolition were sown. Samuel Stillman in 1768 preached a powerful message condemning chattel slavery. So that was a part of the early godly preaching in our nation. There were several hundred Puritan preachers in the colonies. Uh, they were in Britain. Almost a third of them came to the colonies to settle America. These preachers were clear that Scripture supported independence and the guideline of biblical faith in determining justice and questions of human existence. Much more could be said, but suffice it to say that although America was not founded as a Christian nation, we have never been a nation filled with devoted followers of Jesus. We have always had some. And the framers of the Declaration of Independence never mentioned Jesus, but they were men. Some were Christian, some were nominal Christians, and some were deists. But they all had in common a belief in a supreme being that governed the affairs of men. When we see life that it is now in our nation, the question is, how do we respond? The Word of God is ageless and our guide. David gives us a key, I believe, in Psalm 11 uh, when he uh, is talking here. And it's very interesting in this psalm, in my studies, I found something I didn't know. I have always thought of this psalm, and especially verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? as a question of when things are going bad in the nation, when the government is being dismantled or something like that, how can it be? But you know that Scripture was written to them for us. So what is the context of this? 
And in looking at the context of this passage and studying in the Old Testament, I believe the context is when David uh, was struggling with Absalom, his son, who had started an insurrection against him. And David was in the palace in Jerusalem, and all of his advisors were saying, run, run, run. You can read about that in 2 Samuel. From chapter 5 up to about chapter, uh, well, let me just tell you what chapter. When you read chapters 5 through 15, uh, and actually 18, 5 through 18, you'll get the context of that battle, of David struggling. He succeeded Saul as king, and uh, remember Israel was a theocracy defined by God. No other nation on the face of the earth, no other people are a theocracy until we come to the New Testament when Jesus is the head of the church and Lord over the church. And so there will not be another biblical theology, theocracy until the millennium. That will not happen in nations today and for us to try to make it that way is to subvert the purposes of God ours is to reach out and to evangelize but Israel was established as a theocracy Saul was the first king not of God's will David was the king that was a man after his own heart and yet David himself had failures many failures in his life and Absalom one of his sons was a wicked man he was what we would call today a, um, a, a he, he would have advocated everything that the new liberalism, uh, that generation has advocated. In, in fact, he was so opposed to his father and so unashamed of anything that he set a tent on top of the palace and with David's ten concubines that he left in the palace, he had sex with every one of them in that tent inside of the whole nation. He was wicked. He sought his father's kingdom. David's advisors advised him, run, get out of here. And so David did leave the palace, but he never got farther away from Jerusalem uh, than the Mount of Olives, and, and he stayed there. And that's the context. That provides the context for Psalm 11. And you see it clearly when you look at it. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They set their arrows against the strings. They shoot from the shadows at the upright in the heart. And then verse 3, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want to give you an alternate reading of that. And I believe it's true to the Hebrew text. You won't find it in many of the commentaries. Most of the commentaries take the traditional. Uh, the translations take the traditional. But I, I want to give you this and see if you don't think it makes sense with the context of the psalm. The alternate reading of that is when the foundations are being destroyed, what is the righteous one doing? Now keep in mind in those first few verses, David has told his advisors, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to me, flee? Now, the wicked are doing this, etc., etc. When the foundations are being destroyed, when everything is being dismantled that we've depended upon, the foundations are being destroyed. David's question, I believe, was what is the righteous one doing? What's God doing? You see, ladies and gentlemen, that's the issue for us. It, it, it isn't some, some denominations do spiritual warfare by standing in the background and screaming at demons and screaming at the devil. We have a more sure word in the New Testament. His advisors are saying, run, flee, get out of here. Save yourself. And David's saying, wait a minute, in the Lord I take refuge. What, what is the righteous one doing? What's God doing? 
And verse 4, he goes on to say, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men, his eyes examining them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men will see his face. Do you see how that fits the context of the psalm? What's God doing? I believe the alternative text is correct. I believe that's the Hebrew and the correct reading of that text. And I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I have to study after those who are. But when I found this in the footnote of my study Bible and I began to look and explore the context and everything there, I believe it is. And I think for us today as we walk into this 4th of July Independence Day celebrating the birth of our nation in 1776 at the Congressional Congress I believe it's appropriate we look at this psalm from the vanity uh, not vanity but from the vantage and perspective of David and what is he saying here He is saying to his advisors, he's saying to us, and remember that Ahithophel was one of his advisors who tried to play both ways. He tried to be an advisor to Absalom as well as King David, and it cost him his life. Compromise always loses. And David is saying to them and to us, I will trust the Lord. And that ought to be the believer's perspective. Whatever comes our way in our life, it could be foundations of government, it could be foundations of whatever uh, that, that are looking, it could be the foundations of our own life that's coming apart or whatever. What is our response? I will trust the Lord. He, he says in that first verse, in the Lord I take refuge. You see, there are three reasons why he did that. Number one is that God knows what happens on earth. God's not off on a journey somewhere. He's not taking a hike in the Rockies. He sits on his throne, enthroned in the heavenlies, and he knows what's happening. He rules the heavenly council. He knows what's happening on earth. He is sovereign, and he rules. Verse 4, the first part of it said, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. David had confidence that God has not abandoned us regardless of the situation around us, regardless of what's happening in the secular realm and in this earth. God has not abandoned his own. The Lord is in his holy temple. He actively reigns in his heavenly council. The second thing that David pulls out of this psalm and says to us is God tests the motives of the human heart. You and I get to watch one another's actions. But I want to assure you, God looks into our hearts and he knows the why that we do what we do. The why that we say what we say. And all through the scripture, we're given God's truth to determine his will and how we behave and what we we should do. But in the second part of verse 4, it simply says, the Lord's eyes see. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. He tests the motives. I want to ask you a question this morning. If God is testing your motive today, in whatever area of action you're involved in, whether it's something in this church, whether it's at your work, whether it's at school, whether it's out among friends, why do you do what you do and why do you say what you say? And is there absolute integrity in that? You say, I'm so grateful as a pastor, nobody's accountable to me. Oh yeah, I'm accountable to people, committees, and to this church. I'm accountable to all of you. Uh, Staff, I I supervise staff. There's those things on the human level, but when it comes to the heart, 
I can't see what's in your heart. You can't see what's in mine. We can't see what's in one another's heart. Only God tests the motives. Only God judges the heart. But it is how we act that we reveal to everyone else around us what's really going on inside our life. And David was saying, I- I'm not going to walk in fear. I'll trust the Lord. God knows what's happening on earth. God tests the motives of the human heart. And even farther, he said, God distinguishes between good and evil. I just read it in that verse. God knows the difference between good and evil coming out of the motives of our heart. And sometimes when I grew up, I, I had a sweet, sweet lady. She, she was a wonderful lady. And I was a child, and everybody loved her. But she would stand in church to give testimonies. And I'm always scared of people that you don't know what's coming out of their mouth. And she would stand up, and she would say, Well, if I know my heart... She not only didn't know her heart, she didn't know her Bible. God told Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. Jesus talked to us out of the heart, out of the inner being, comes an abundance of what we say, what we think. You see, and that's why only God is capable of looking at the heart and judging the heart. When I was in Amsterdam in 86, a long time ago, I mean almost a millennium ago, it seems, my roommate at the Billy Graham uh, World Conference on Evangelism was Phineas Dubé. He was an African disciple of men who's gone on to heaven now. And Phineas and I sat and we talked and we took pictures of one another and I took my pictures back and I tried to get them to develop and Phineas' picture didn't develop. So we had the kind of relationship that I could joke with him and I said, Dear Phineas, I wrote him a letter. I I said, uh, I took your picture. I took it to the place to be developed and I said... Uh, When it was developed, there was no Phineas. It could not be developed. So I said, I'm really wondering if Phineas actually exists. If he does, let me know. Put a big smiley face that I drew. We didn't have the emoticons then. Put that thing in the mail, and uh, months later it arrived in Africa, and he wrote one, and a couple of months later it arrived at my mailbox, and Phineas said, my dear brother Ted... Yes, indeed, Phineas does exist. But the problem, dear friend, is not with Phineas, but it is with your camera. You see, you have a camera that is incapable of looking at the real Phineas and photographing him. Only God can do that. And then he had some words of friendship and things of that nature. Only God can look at our hearts. David was so confident against his enemies that he could write this, he could stand his ground, and he could say, God is my refuge. I'll trust in him. He knows my heart. He knows their hearts. God will judge, and he did. The Lord tests both righteous and wicked. His patience is to give us time to repent. So I encourage you today, if you're not in a rightly related relationship with God, you'll have opportunity to settle that today and begin that spiritual journey. And I encourage you to do it. The second thing is not only David saying, I will trust God, but he's saying in this psalm, I will be courageous. I'm not going to run from the evil that's all around me. Yes, I'll leave the palace and move to another area of Jerusalem to save my life so that I can stand another day. But I will not flee evil. 
in the sense of them attacking him. Fleeing evil in the sense of participation, yes, but not in the sense of being so scared of the evil one, so scared of what the devil is doing, so scared of people that we run and we cower and the kingdom of God is stifled when we cower. And we don't have to. God has not given us a spirit of fear, the New Testament says. Paul wrote that to the young preacher Timothy. And here in this passage, he assures us that the Lord is righteous. In Psalm 27, 14, he he talks to us about fear. It's all through the Psalms, whether they be David's or whether they be another. But in 27, 14, these words are written, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I'm telling you, folks, we win. God is with us. Now, God may or may not be with our form of government. That's a man-made form of government. We believe prizing and valuing freedom, and we believe the best on the face of the earth. But in the purposes of God, we don't know when he's going to let that fail or survive. But it doesn't matter from the standpoint of the believer because he is our refuge. He gives us courage and we stand for truth. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14. Great passage. That's our spiritual warfare passage, by the way, beginning in verse 10 when he says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And verse 14 says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Wow. Wow. Take heart. Take heart. We've been in battles for Christian morals in this country For a great number of years, Roe v. Wade, it didn't begin there. It won't end where we are now. It will be a battle until Christ comes again. Because those things are a battle not between people of differing opinions, but ours is a battle for truth. Just as in the founding of our country with our Christian forebears, those who came loving the Lord, those who came seeking religious freedom. One author talked about being the master of his fate. William Ernest Henley in his poem Invictus said, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of of my soul. I I would submit, and I believe Mr. Henley is aware of that, wherever he is in eternity, but I would submit that he was very wrong. David said, God is the master of my fate. God is the one who handles my affairs. And that was a worldview that I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul, that came out of the enlightenment, out of rationalism, and infected the early days even of our government and our nation and some of our liberal preaching. But it is in contradiction to the revealed word of God and a biblical worldview. The biblical worldview says God is the captain of my soul. And I will follow him. Commentator by the name of Golden Gay said the Psalms know that Yahweh is involved in life now and they often testify to that involvement. Psalm 11 is declaring a conviction about this. Brothers and sisters, David in this Psalm is talking about two things, trusting God and taking courage in God. And I submit that's what we need to do today as individuals, as citizens of this nation, understanding that we have dual citizenship, temporary citizenship in America, but eternal citizenship in heaven. For Paul said, our citizenship is in heaven, and heaven should rule. 
It's all through the Christian Standard Bible translation in Daniel. Heaven rules. Someone said that we need both courage and wisdom. Wisdom without courage is useless. But courage without wisdom is dangerous. Trust in God. Have the courage to stand in him without fear. Samuel Stillman was pastor of First Baptist Church in Boston. In an election sermon that I talked about earlier, in one of those election sermons, he vigorously opposed Britain's declaratory act of 1766, in which the British Parliament claimed it hath of a right to have full power and authority to make laws and statutes of a sufficient force and validity to bind the colonies and people of America in all cases whatsoever. Stillman referred to it as an arbitrary philosophy of a bygone age. In quoting his sermon, he said, The time has been when the divine right of kings sounded from the pulpit in the press and when the sacred name of religion was brought in to sanctify the most horrid systems of despotism and cruelty. Watch for that in contemporary America. The sacred name of religion or faith in Christ was brought in to sanctify the most horrid systems of despotism and cruelty. And Stillman went on to say, but bless be God. We live in a more happy era in which the great principles of liberty are better understood. With us, it is a first and fundamental principle that God made all men equal. Those were some of the influencers in our nation, men of God who stood before governors and leaders in the halls of government and preached the truth of God and the influence continued until 1964 I believe that's the year when two things happened one that we look at and we know prayer was eliminated as being mandated by anyone in a public sector. I grew up in a school system where every morning Christian teachers led us in prayer. Every month in my high school, we had a local pastor come and preach in chapel. Every month. That was my years of growing up. Miss Bertha Smith told me one day, she said, Pastor, She said, it's been my experience in China and my experience with what I've seen with other missionaries that when Satan is legitimized as a faith, that nation begins to go downhill. Did you know that the Satanic Bible was published by Anton LaVey in 1964? We don't pay much attention to that. But so many of the cults use that Bible, that book. It's not a Bible as we know it. And also, what we are familiar with that I mentioned, prayer was taken from the public sector. And it's gone downhill. It's gone downhill ever since. The interpretation of the Constitution, the Warren Court created laws based on liberal interpretations and there was legislation from the bench. And we find ourselves in a nation for which we are very grateful to be here. But a nation that needs another spiritual awakening to move the people of God not into action as an army, not with guns and knives and sabers, things of that nature, but an army of prayer warriors where the God of heaven, 
who controls the destinies of men and who values freedom for all and who is the righteous one involves himself with the conviction of sin to the point that men and women are repenting of their sin and turning for evil and looking to the book of God for instruction on how to raise their families, how to do church, how to live in a godless society. We are salt and light according to Jesus. And that's my challenge for us, to so live trusting him Courageous to stand for him and to not back up, even when we have to stand alone. Not to make a jerk out of ourselves, not to have some little tertiary mountain out here that we're willing to die on unless everybody does it our way. No. But the substantive issues of truth and righteousness. We stand. We stand. Would you bow your head with me, please? Our praise team's going to come in just a moment. We're so happy that each of you are here, and I want to give you an opportunity. If the Lord Jesus is touching your heart, if there's a conviction in your life that this is the day that I need to make things right in my own life with my God and you need our help, we want to help you. Lance White is going to be here. I'll be standing down at the front. We're going to sing just a verse or two. Ask you to get up out of your seat and come and just say, Pastor, I, I, I want to let God redirect my life. And I'll know exactly how to talk with you, how to ask you, and we'll pray together, and we'll begin this journey together. This is a family church. You're welcome here. I would love to be your pastor, but let's start that journey today. Would you do it? If you need to ask Jesus to come into your life, to take control of your life right where you sit, ask him to do it right now. Lord Jesus, there's a lot of confusion in my life. But I ask you to come in. I believe you died on the cross for my sin, was buried and raised from the dead. I believe that you're alive. And I will trust you. And I will stand for you and confess you as Lord. Come into my life and transform my life. If you prayed a prayer similar to that, something like that, or you didn't and you say, yeah, that expresses who I am and who I want to be, I'm going to ask you when we stand to get up out of your seat and come and meet us here at the front. And you say, why do we ask you to do that? So you can identify yourself. We don't know who you are unless you identify yourself. And so come out of hiding and stand for Jesus. Others of you that may want to join this church, you've made that commitment. You know you're saved. But you want to serve here. If God is speaking to you, if inside your life right now, your heart is feeling a little funny, and you've got a sense of knowing that this is what you should do, you obey that and you get up and come. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the privilege of worship today. And may our hearts and lives be redirected toward you. And we ask in Jesus' name. Let's stand and let's sing.